This Gum Bands podcast is made possible by the Buell Foundation, serving southwestern Pennsylvania since 1927, and by listeners like you. Thank you. Anna Singer is an afternoon announcer on a Pittsburgh radio station. And you're listening to Classical WQED-FM 89.3 Pittsburgh and WQEJ 89.7 Johnstown on HD1 and WQEDFM.org. In recent years, she has become a prolific impressionistic painter. And she has also had an incredible and distinguished career as an opera singer and actress. And when asked, she can still be a wonderful vocalist. <laughs> This is Gum Band's 010, or number 10, and a singer. I haven't ever done this before, but I just thought, you know, uh, we, we are recording this on September 1st, 2023. And it is such a beautiful day. I uh, Driving in, I was astounded, and I thought, I'm going to start just by saying it's a beautiful day in our neighborhood. It is a beautiful day in and our I'm neighborhood. And I'm so happy to be here with Anna Singer, <laughs> who works with me here at WQED. It's Colleagues Day. Yes. And uh, it made me also think, you've been here long enough to remember when Fred Rogers was here. I did. I do remember when Fred Rogers was here. And he was such a fan of WQED-FM, where you work. Mm-hmm. Did you have an encounter or several encounters? I had or? several encounters. I think my first encounter was in the elevator. So that was, you know, I got to ride up the elevator with Fred, and um, he just was smiling and, you know, so pleasant. Um, when they were doing the film here, uh, and Tom Hanks was in the green room and getting ready, I remember when the costume people came out, because we have all those wonderful pictures of Fred in the lobby, and they came out, there were three of them, and it was Fred in his red sweater. And they were going, well, look at this. Now, see how the shoulders are off because his mother makes all of his sweaters for him and there's a pilling effect. So they wanted to be really uh, true to what Fred wore and the costumes. And so they were really kind of taking this picture apart. Excellent. No, I, I love Fred in the elevator stories too. I don't know if there was ever an incident. I actually... My elevator story was with Ricky uh, Wirtz from Ricky and oh Copper. Oh, my gosh. Wow. You know, because I had been on the Ricky and Copper show when I was five. <laughs> and here I was on the elevator with her. She worked uh, She worked in, like, community relations or something like that here back in the late 80s when I, I started here. And uh, I said, uh, you know, Ricky, I was on Ricky and Copper. She goes, don't tell me when. I just want you to know how wonderful your mother was because she got you on that show, and that was hard. Wow. Oh, oh my gosh. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, sometimes if you see Paul Byers, ask him to tell you his story about Fred Rogers on the elevator. I will do that. All right. So, All right. But we are here to talk about Anna today. and uh, I. Uh, well, first I have to ask, though, Rick, because look at you. You, you have a little bit of a... An eye issue here, and did I? <laughs> you did should it, see the other did guy. Hurt? Did it hurt? <laughs> Look at you! Like <laughs> this is a, a boxing injury. Although I really, I just fell onto the cement while I was trying to jog. But it's a uh, fractured fifth metacarpal. But uh, it's like I boxed. We boxed well, together. I fell on the cement while walking, Ugh. and it, you know, yeah. And I've I've learned that I think the blood vessels in your face are really close to the surface. So, you know, I hit here and. Blood splattered across my shirt and all mm-hmm. of that, but you know, I'm lucky. I, it wasn't a major fall, and both times I sorry, I fell twice on the same day. This was the second fall, and uh, both times uh, there were kind couples nearby who came and helped. Oh, that's nice. Yes. So uh, another good neighborhood. Oh, I've been very lucky. Yes. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, you know, uh, we'll survive. <laughs> um, but since I already asked that, like. Uh, I, I can't remember a time when you weren't here, but I think I was probably here when you started. Uh, you were definitely here when I started. I The story that get got me here is kind of fun because my husband plays trumpet. He's got a real job. He's a lawyer. 
but um, he was asked to play on that wonderful evening where there it's first night Pittsburgh. So uh, he was playing one of Lucas Richmond's pieces. And so we were down at this church, and uh, everybody, all the instrumentalists were getting ready. And of course, there were vocalists that were a part of it, where they're all over in the corner, wrapped up in their scarves and all sorts of things. And I spoke to the vocalists, and the gal, the soprano, said, "Um, do you give voice lessons? And I said, of course I give voice lessons. So we're doing voice lessons at my home, and she goes, you know, you have a wonderful speaking voice. Have you ever thought about radio? I said, of course I've thought about radio, (laughs) but I have no idea how to get started. And at that time, her husband was a substitute announcer here at QED. So they arranged an interview and a time to speak with Ted Sawyer. And I started as a substitute announcer in March of 2000. Wow. Mm-hmm. All right. And uh, just filling in for Ted or filling in for, for everybody? everybody? For, so any time of day. For Judy, for Ted, for Jim, uh, for Paul. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Wow. And... Um, now the staff there is tiny it at, is. Our, at our radio station. I mean, are we the smallest radio station in Pittsburgh? I'm going to go with yes. <laughs> We're I think two so. and a half people. Two yeah. and a half people. <laughs> no, you're really three. Oh, you're the half. I'm the half because I'm not here full time. Ah, oh, amazing. Mm-hmm. But you, you come and uh, I'm, I'm just, I've, I've always been interested in like the technicalities of what you do. You select most of the music for the day. And that's what happened sort of around 2002 or three or something like that. They said, um, we need your help. Uh, the person who was uh, picking the music, the music programmer, uh, left and said, you know, this will be about for six weeks. <laughs> 20 years later. 20 years later. um, We still, I still have the opportunity to uh, go into our library. And I tell you what, I find new pieces every week that I am fascinated by. And I play the old chestnuts, you know, Bach, Brandenburg, or uh, Beethoven 9 or 5th or something like that. But then there are these great pieces like secondary Russian composers or secondary Czech composers, even secondary American composers that I will get on to the air. And it's a lot of fun because people will respond. They say, you know, I love that piece by, I have never heard it before. I even Andres Cardenas called at one point and said, I've never heard that violin concerto before. Tell me about it. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. Wow. So, um, I, I, you know, if someone doesn't know, Anna is on WQED FM, which is our radio station here and actually adjacent to where we're sitting right now. And it's all classical all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're usually on in the afternoons. Yes. Uh, But I know sometimes you sub for Jim Cunningham in the mornings if he's not here. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently that was your original intention, (laughs) (laughs) just to be a substitute. Uh, (laughs) But um, literally... You then, I mean, and isn't it, I don't, I don't know, because I don't know the world of classical music that well. Um, I love the fact that you still deal with CDs. Oh, we had that opportunity to get all of our CDs um, taken to Chicago. The Half of they would have split the library up and taken to Chicago and all loaded into the ENCO, where I think every other classical music station, that's how they do it. But then we would have lost all our information because we don't have the staff uh, enough staff to put in all of the booklet information about why this composer wrote this like Wagner wrote for his wife on Christmas Day which was her birthday her beautiful um, um, Siegfried Idil, and he brought all of the instrumentalists into the house. They were up the stairs and around the hallway, and they played this for her on Christmas Day, which happened to be her birthday. We would lose those stories, or we wouldn't have the time to be able to look up that information. So you guys still do that. You pull out the, the liner notes and read, read the, read the liner, liner notes. notes. Absolutely, because there's so much information there. Yeah. Okay. Although Jim, I think he knows everything by heart. <laughs> he just, and, and he will say something. I learn something new from him all the time. And, and we should mention that WQED-FM is celebrating its 50 years on the air this year. So right. we've already said it's September 1st, 2023, and we're deep into the 50th year celebration. Um, is that unusual? 
Oh, I think it's very unusual. As a matter of fact, I just read another classical music station died this past Monday. Uh, very up in, um, I think, uh, New England, uh, Vermont, uh, or either Vermont or Maine or something. It's gone all news. Mm. So um, that's unfortunate. And we're so lucky here in Pittsburgh because we actually have three listener-supported stations. We have the classical music station, we have the folk YEP with sort of AAA music, and then we have the news NPR. Um, with WESA. Uh, yeah, WESA. So... No, we are lucky, and 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 I think all three stations are just such beautiful examples of public broadcasting. Right, right. You know, and I think we're uh, they're appreciated by different people and the same people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we have uh, there's you know we have the television station here at QED, and it appeals to a different group of people than the radio station, and um, I always find that kind of interesting, and uh, the but radio, there's crossover. It, oh, of course there's crossover, but. Um, I just love it when I'm, you know, I have a face for radio. I'm in my little dark studio and I talk to 100,000 people or whatever and it's great. But when I'm in a restaurant or something and somebody hears my voice, I'm sure, um, you know, you get sort of sometimes with visually you are recognizable, but people recognize the voice and that's a lot of fun. No, for a long time, I, I, the only time I could be re- uh, recognized was when I was doing Pledge because in my shows, I'm usually not there. It's usually just my voice. Okay, okay. Um, until I think I started to do the show called It's Pittsburgh and a lot of other stuff, and then you started to see me more. Okay. Um, but, uh, no, that's always fun, too. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I, I know that voice. I know that voice, yeah. Yeah, um, and usually it's not exactly the way I pictured you looking. <laughs> oh, I can't. <laughs> I won't even tell you what some people have thought. <laughs> you don't look anything like your voice. <laughs> well, we all do that. We, we imagine what those radio voices Yes, sound and I'd like, like to like. go with some of those imaginations. <laughs> well, cool. So, um, but you've also mentioned that you have a background uh, in uh, classical music and singing and opera mm-hmm. and all of that. Um, from an early age? From an early age. I... Um, I had a wonderful church uh, situation where I sang in the youth choir. I was the choir mother to the little kids. I sang in the adult choir, and I was part of the motet choir, and we had an amazing choir director, and this was all while I was in um, high school. So we did shows like Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, Godspell. We even did Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, which was done as a church show originally. That's what it was written for. And then it became this huge thing on Broadway. Um, And so it was that particular person, Lee Kohlenberg, and then also Michael Knob, who steered me toward wanting to sing. Lee would have me imitate Beverly Sills. And then I saw Beverly Sills and Carol Burnett, because I always, Carol Burnett, oh my (laughs) gosh, two redheads. I mean, I can't believe my hair isn't red. Um, there was a great special called Sills and Burnett at the Met, and they made me laugh so hard. I had such a great time, and uh, I also watched Beverly Sills do The Daughter of the Regiment from Wolf Trap, and there she was stomping all over the stage and making people laugh, and uh, I was entranced. So then um, I had an opportunity to sing A Mall in the Night Visitors, which is a beautiful Christmas opera by Giancarlo Menotti. And I did it in the church that I grew up in, which was St. Stephen's. And then the following year, I got to do it as a tour around the Pittsburgh area. And I know uh, I'm a girl, and the girls are not supposed to do a mall, but I just fell in love with that piece. And then I thought, well, I'd like to become an opera singer. Um, I even did that piece uh, at the World Trade Center as the mother in the lobby one, um, one summer. Wow. Uh, yeah, um, but I did that piece, and I think I came home and announced to my parents, oh, I'm going to be an opera singer. And I'd been playing piano since I was four or five and uh, playing tennis and doing lots of performing things and on the stage in school and all that kind of stuff. And my mother looked at me and said, yeah, right. Name three operas. <laughs> and I couldn't. <laughs> Whoa. No, I had no idea. Even in high school. Even in high school, um, I think I was just so taken aback because I was like, well, but I just like to perform so I could, I could act. 
I could dance. I was great on stage. The thing where I kind of wasn't the best was singing. So I thought, well, if I can figure this out, then I can make it happen. But it took a long time to figure it out. <laughs> no, I, I like the fact that you came to opera like through sort of a comedic route. Yes, you know, that you yes, were like yes. You wanted to make people laugh. Right. And I, I think that's not the way a lot of people think of opera. <laughs> um, but I also, before we get too far afield, do you know Fred Rogers' connection to Amal and the Night Visitors? I do not, no. He was the floor manager for the premiere broadcast, and that was written for television. I know it was written for Fred, television. He, I Fred didn't. was working at NBC in New York, and he and there are pictures of him backstage at the original production of Amal and the Night Visitors. And I have worked with the original Amal on stage. Who was that? Oh, oh no. Okay. You were gonna, I'm, I, I'm sorry I asked that question. You don't have to. He no, goes by one name now. And, but I was um, going to say, I also... Uh, I interviewed Minotti twice. Oh, wow. Once in Australia, when following the Spoleto Arts Festival. I, he was always in Charleston, South Carolina, right. when I worked in South Carolina. And then I got to go to the first Spoleto Arts Festival in Melbourne, Australia, and I interviewed him there. In fact, there's a picture of me you know, with a microphone outside the Arts Center in mm, Melbourne. It fabulous. was really wonderful, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, yeah, I, I've always loved the fact that Fred has that connection. Oh, yeah. And I think that's it's probably Minotti's most famous work. I think so. Um, you know, it's a little less recognized now, um, which is kind of sad because I think it's such a beautiful work for the holiday. Um, so uh, such beautiful music, and the story, of course, is wonderful. And it's very short. It's only about maybe 50 minutes long or something like that. Right, an hour of television. Yeah, an hour of television, exactly. Okay, so... That's high school. You start to have this real passion yeah, for, yeah. for opera and performing and all of that. So Well, performing, I mentioned quickly that um, I played tennis as an amateur, but I did a couple of professional tournaments and things like that. But I discovered that I played better tennis in front of an audience. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. You feed I, off the energy. I do. I really feed off the energy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of interesting because as a radio person, you don't really get that, do you? Well, now I'm an introvert. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. People say, <laughs> no, you're not. And I say, yes, I am because I, I need to revitalize after doing something like this. I love doing it. I love being on. But then give me a chance to recuperate afterward. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you tell your mother that you want to be an opera singer. Right. And, and you can't name three operas. But, but I learned decide. three songs to audition at conservatories. So I auditioned at Boston Conservatory, uh, out in Lawrence University uh, in Wisconsin, um, Cincinnati, and um, Peabody Institute of the Johns Hopkins University. And um, As a senior in high school. As a senior in high school. Yeah. And I was, you know, I was 17 at this point still, 16, 17, because I, my birthday is late. Okay. So um, everybody was, Boston looks at me and said, oh, you're a soprano. There's no way you're going to get in. And I had my acceptance letter within like 45 minutes. <laughs> it was like, you know, wow. wow. And it was, it was, that was very cool. But I ended up going to Peabody because both Mickey and Maribeth Knob were um Maribeth received her graduate degree from there and Mickey got his bachelor's from there and then he came to Carnegie Mellon University and she started as um, a teacher at Slippery Rock University so um, they came to Pittsburgh and I met them through the choir that I was singing in um, we uh, we did them all he was uh, Mickey was the the Melchior the the big guy who gets to sing the fabulous beautiful piece about um this boy doesn't need your gold and that sort of thing so we became uh friends and very good friends as a matter of fact we just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary and i knew them right when they got married and um he also became a teacher at Swigley Academy. So I think he was a teacher for my final year at the academy. That's where you went to high school. And that's where I went to high school, exactly. I started there at uh, nursery school and just went the whole time through at Swigley Academy because I grew up in Swigley. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I know a little bit about your earliest appearance on Earth. And, and I remember uh, I had known you for a long time before I found out that uh, you had a connection to the children's home. I do have a connection to the children's home. I'm adopted. And uh, you were adopted as an infant? I was adopted as an infant. I think I came home. I was born in September, and I came home in January. 
to for my mom and dad. That's excellent. It really was. And my brother was adopted also. And uh, it's kind of interesting because he was three years and five days younger than I was. So... Um, you were adopted together. We, not, we weren't adopted together. No, oh. he was adopted. And then um, he came home. Mom and dad brought him home three years later. And I said, that's very nice. Take him home now. You can take him back now. <laughs> <laughs> I think every older kid says that. No, that's fine. You can go away now. <laughs> I had enough of that one. Yeah. Well, that is, I mean, it, 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 it adds to this sort of like uh, fairy tale existence. Uh, you know, it really is. And my mother was kind of a miracle because she had rheumatic fever when she was very young. And she took to horseback riding because her heart was injured. And then um, she met and worked for my father. Uh, he owned a children's store. But she couldn't have children. But eventually, in 1969, she had, I think, her third open heart surgery. And she went up to um, uh, the Rochester, the, the uh, great institute there, and had two steel valves put into her heart. Steel valves? Steel valves. Not even, we weren't at the pig level yet. It's 69. And you could hear her clickety-clack, clickety-clack, clickety-clack. Wow. And then a bunch of years later, it's the 90s, I'm down in um, Sarasota, Sing, Sarasota, um, Fort Myers, somewhere in there, singing. Florida. Singing, Florida. And it's a homestay. And I started talking about my mother. And the gentleman who owns the house is a doctor who was her anesthesiologist. Wow. Yes. So, and because that was, I mean, it was a huge thing. And I think she was the longest living person with two steel valves in her heart. She almost made it 30 years. That is excellent. Yeah. 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 Wow. So she was a force to be reckoned with. I mean, she was Annie Oakley. She w became a uh, champion skeet shooter. She was a champion horsewoman. Um, uh, my dad also, she and my dad would do, uh, they would travel around and do all of this shooting, and they were just at the top of their game and won all these trophies. I mean, there's like a room filled with silver trophies that they they won. That is excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, so... Uh you, you go off uh, to Johns Hopkins, to Peabody. To Peabody. Mm -hmm. And that's Baltimore. Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're just there for the four years of college? No, I, um, <clears throat> I got engaged. And <laughs> I got engaged uh, to Dawn number one. And then... Um, <laughs> all I, your husbands are named Dawn? No, no. Well, all of... Uh, <laughs> the all serious of their, boyfriends. There were serious boyfriends. <laughs> um, and then I realized that wasn't going to work. Um, but because I was, I was originally, I had wanted to take a year off and then go to Yale for my graduate, uh, for voice. Uh, but then I realized, okay, I'm going to get married. So let me just do quickly a master's in a year, which is what I did. But in that year, I decided also um, with Peabody at, at Peabody, I, that getting married was not, uh, the best choice at that time. So I, I didn't get married. I broke the engagement. Bad idea. Bad way. It was challenging. 8181 was the date we were supposed to get married wow yeah yeah All right. yeah um and uh you get a master's and then you start to perform around the world uh i get a master's and then i start doing dinner theater so i moved to washington dc okay and uh because you, as an opera singer you sort of need to take a little bit of time for the voice to develop and i always love music theater so. and that's still your dream at that point oh yeah you're definitely. not thinking i want to be a you know, a DJ in the afternoon at WQED. No, that didn't cross my mind. <laughs> Hard to believe. <laughs> You're still thinking opera singer, right? Right. Okay. So, and I go to DC, and um, I end up singing for um, someone in the audience, and uh, Phyllis Bryn Yulson, and she's a wonderful teacher. And so I started working with her, and then uh, I came back to Pittsburgh because I wanted to work uh, with Claudia Pinza because Claudia had a program in Italy for young American singers. And so I came back and started working with her and had the opportunity to go to her program, EPCASO, the Ezio Pinza Council for American Singers of Opera, uh, three summers in a row. And then the fourth summer I spent in- And that was in Italy. That was in Italy. That was in Vittorio Veneto. And then the fourth, fourth summer I went to Cleveland to sing in a mall I went in a gown. We're in the food court. 
everybody's eating their fries and their things, and I'm sitting there, and I win the competition and get to spend the summer in Italy in Siena again too. Wow, not yeah. with the same program. No, it's a different. It was a different program. Yeah. Wow, you mm-hmm. won a food court competition. A food court competition. <laughs> there are other competitions I also won, but that one was kind of the most odd. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. that's a great story. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, uh, at this point, you you have a repertoire. You you have like favorite things that you do, or yeah. So um, I'm I'm here. I'm in Pittsburgh. I'm learning lots of things, and then I make that decision that I need to move to New York because if I'm going to do this opera thing, it's time to take it seriously, buckle down, and and go to New York. So I moved to New York. I lived up on 200th Street, Dykeman Street. I lived on a, in a, I lived on the sixth floor of a sixth floor walk up. Whoa. Then I moved to 180th Street and I lived on the fifth floor of a sixth floor walk up. Then I moved to 96th Street and I lived on the fourth floor of a sixth floor walk up. Finally, I moved to 69th and Broadway and I was on the second floor and it had an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And like, and where are you singing then? I'm singing everywhere. I'm singing wherever anybody will let me sing. So uh, whether it was a, a young a young artist program, I did the young artist program down in Florida uh, with Sarasota. Uh, I did, I was singing in Lake George. I was singing in Cleveland. Um, I was singing all around the United States. Then uh, there was a company that was based out of Bulgaria. So this is right when the wall came down, and so I went went over and rehearsed in Bulgaria. But then we toured France and... um, Germany. uh, Not Germany, no, France, and uh, I think we might have had one uh, uh, performance in Switzerland. And I think the first time I went with them, I actually went with my voice teacher who was in New York City, and we were doing Lohengrin. So he was the Lohengrin, and I was the Elsa. So it was kind of fun to be on stage together with my voice teacher. And, um, you know, if he would breathe for me, just, you know, <laughs> get ready to breathe here. And then we also And you would probably did, get notes afterwards. I went a little bit. Um, but we also did the Beethoven 9. And so it was amazing because we had 110 Bulgarians in these buses. We went by from city to city in these amazing buses. And we had bus drivers who couldn't read the language because that all they read was Cyrillic <laughs> it's just like hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, these performances would be greeted with 20 minute ovations and screaming and shouting and just it was so so amazing but also opera starts late in Europe so let's say it the Lohengrin started at 8 30 or 9 I would be on the stage at midnight going I am so tired my feet really hurt would you just get on the swan and go away <laughs> so but it was fun excellent and so how long did you do that um I I was doing things throughout the 90s and early 2000s uh all over so a lot of Europe and then also in the United States and Pittsburgh is always your home it has always been my home yes I swore I'd never come back but then I got set up on a blind date with the same gentleman who encouraged me to go into music, Mickey Knob. Mickey, um, I came home to be with my mother and her final illness, and I went on a blind date and was married a year later. Wow. So I didn't intend to come back. I was going to say, because you you, you mentioned 2000, and you also mentioned that as the year you started here. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you Mm -hmm. must have been still singing and everything when you started at I was still singing, and it was great. And you still sing now. I still sing now, but um, in one of the exciting things about uh, performing and meeting Don was uh, the first, our third date, he actually traveled all the way up to the Berkshires to hear me sing a Beethoven Misa Solemnis. That was our third date. The first date was a blind date. The second date we got together and we thought, um, he said, well, I'd love to hear you sing. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not singing anywhere close by. This is what I'm singing. And he thought for a moment and he said, I can do that. And I said, cool. And that's actually what's in our wedding rings, because at that time, I didn't know that he had issues Mrs. with... Mrs. Solemnis is in your... No, no. I can do that. Cool. 
Tamisa <laughs> Salamnis is not in in our wedding rings, but um, I can do that. Cool. I can do That's that cool because better. I didn't know whether he didn't. You know, he had kids, so he didn't realize if that weekend was a weekend where he had the kids or not. And so it worked out that. Uh, Good um, man. Yeah, I and mean, and it was really amazing because uh, he had a friend who. Uh, took him out and got him um, a bit inebriated the night before, <laughs> <laughs> tried to make him not go. <laughs> but he got there. He got there. Excellent. That is a great story, too, because, you know, I know Don. And then that, you know Don. And yeah. then there's, um, you know, he sees me do a comedy, uh, comic work for the first time, Cosi Fantute, where I'm Fiordaligi, and I have to sing my what off, and but it's also very funny. And then, then he sees me do Zolome, and... Um, uh, this particular production, I mean, you do the Dance of the Seven day Veils and you get naked on stage and all that kind of stuff. And then you sing to a bloodied head for 17 minutes. And he came backstage and he said, oh, gosh, honey, that was amazing. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that in my life. You are amazing as an actress. I'm not going home with you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I think I scared him. <laughs> Probably so with that bloody mm-hmm. head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that is, uh, and so I mean, uh, I know I've seen you in a couple of things. I, right. I, I, right. I, I saw you do Julia Child mm-hmm. in that's called Bon Appetit, I think. Bon Appetit. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a one-person opera. It's a one-person opera. There is an American composer. His name is Lee Hoiby, and he actually took an episode of her. She is baking a chocolate cake, and. Um, he took the whole piece and wrote it actually with her sort of rhythmic voice uh, up and down. Uh, she sings a lot in tritones, uh, which is kind of an odd, odd way to speak or sing. And uh, so you can't find that episode. I think he must have bought it. <laughs> and, uh, but it's uh, Julia Child is out there as uh, Bon Appetit. And this is the Don't rich it, it. buttery brown batter of legato chocolat lemonade's <laughs> brune? Oh, I just remember it as being so much fun. It, just... it is a lot of fun, and the reason her voice sounded like that is she had extra long vocal cords, which all the women in her family, her sister, her mother, they all had this these cords that were extra long. So there was sort of this thing that was going on. Yeah, and, and what an icon of public broadcasting. Oh, my gosh, yes. You know? I mean, the wonderful stories <laughs> where, oh, I, I love that whole thing where she's cooking an omelet for the um, review of her recipe book and, uh, you know, doesn't even fit on the stage or, and the guys don't know what to do. It's right. great. Right, and, and you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the great episode where she's on with Fred Rogers here. Yes, yes, and, yes, yes. And, and, mm-hmm. and I think uh, Johnny Costa comes in and makes pasta with her. Right, so it's, right. it's really, you know... Uh, totally excellent, and to think that, you know, here in our building, Mr. Rogers and Julia, and Child, Julia Child were together in the kitchen mm-hmm. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> with yeah. Johnny Costa. <laughs> um, so, um, but I also saw you in uh, Sweeney Todd. Oh. And so that's not an opera, but it's almost an opera, isn't well, it? Well, no, it's not an opera. It is music theater, but it's the best music theater. If, I, if somebody walked up to me today and said, would you do Sweeney Todd? I, I would absolutely say yes. And the other one that I love is Desiree in A Little Night Music. So I did that one with a, the year before or two years before I did the Sweeney Todd. I think I saw that too. And you might have, yeah. I think yeah. I did. Yeah. And I do love that. I, I think uh, that was to be my first... Broadway show that I saw oh, on Broadway. Wow! But uh, when I got to New York on that trip, we found out about the half-price tickets in Times Square. Oh, mm-hmm. and so uh, I saw Tommy Toon in Seesaw. Oh my gosh! As my first Broadway show, and then the next night we saw, or that night maybe it was we saw a matinee and then a uh, thing, and that was uh, 1973. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so uh, you continue to have like somewhat of a dual career as a singer. Mm -hmm. and an afternoon DJ Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, but you also have other lives Mm -hmm. and uh, I am so impressed with your painting thank you Uh, and how does that start and why does it start and you know uh, we're surrounded by some of your work some of the some of the things are back there yes um, Um, yeah but it it started with my mother painted, and I always admired her painting, and I was always really taken by 
paintings. I would go to into galleries and just look around. Not necessarily, you know, uh, Carnegie Museum and look at those galleries. I, I do now all the time. But I just loved seeing new works. And uh, there is so much on the internet. So I started taking, I just started listening and copying and, and doing classes on the internet. And then I finally uh, took the plunge and did a class in person. Um, although right before that, before that happened, uh, we went on a vacation with uh, three other couples up into the Cook's Forest. And one of the gals was a fabulous painter. And Dawn said, you should just work with this woman. And she just invited me over to her, her studio and we would paint together. And she didn't really you know, uh, say anything. We just painted together. So, But it gave me the freedom to paint, to start. And this is a, as an adult. This isn't in high school. No, no. This is like in <laughs> <You're already> 2014 <laughs> or 2013 or 2014. Oh, yeah. so, okay, really recently. Right, fairly recently. And, um, and then I had an opportunity to take a year off from WQED. And I really <laughs> uh, focused on the painting then. And... Um, then in 2018, I went out to uh, Scottsdale and took my first in-person class with someone I had been taking lessons with for a while. And man, it was like, it was so much fun. And so I've been painting ever since. I've been doing a little bit of plein air now, which is a little bit more challenging because you go outdoors. But I went to um, Maine this summer, to Monhegan Island, which is where Edward Hopper painted and also um, the... Uh, the uh, Wyeths are still there. Jamie Wyeth is still lives there. And um, I actually uh, painted the cliffs where his house is. His house was kind of in fog. I, I'll probably tackle it at some point. And one of the other um, members of the class saw Jamie at one point. But supposedly he gets into a little, um, like a, a, a box, and has a little view outside and paints inside the box so that nobody disturbs him when he's painting. Now, that I, you know, who knows if that's myth or whatever, but that's what I understand. And, and plein air means that you set up an easel and you're actually painting at the location. At the location, outside, and pretty quickly, um, you now, know. We, we have some of your paintings, little paintings right here. and That's like a plein air painting. This is a plein air painting, and it's, uh, it, it's, a it's little the coast lighthouse. of Maine. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, these all, and you, and you do a lot of these still lifes. I love to do still life, and I just really, I enjoy it a lot. And I'm, I don't, this is just my own, I mean, I, I, you know, I know teeny bit about art, but I, I think they're, they're sort of impressionistic. Oh, definitely. Th definitely. Th Especially when, when my, my husband says, well, that line isn't straight. And I say, I'm an impressionist. <laughs> yeah, no, you and, know, and, and, just, and the, the, the daubs of paint. and The daubs of paint, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, it, they're, they're beautiful. They're, thank they're, you. I just, I love them, and... Uh, thank you, thank you. Oh, here's one with food. And, the, and food is good. I, I've had dinner at Anna's house, so I know that she also loves food. And, well, th this is actually uh, a little section of a painting um, that I fell in love with. Uh, what's the gallery out? Um, it's a Merrick Museum out um, in, is it Butler? Oh, no, I should have checked. But anyway, it's, um, it's an amazing museum that has these paintings. You can go in and uh, it's just fabulous. At some point, I'm hoping to do an evening of painting and singing out there and just having a great time. Uh, Ricky Granati's gonna try to make that all happen, so. Excellent. Yeah, What's but um, yeah, I just keep on I painting. I love showing these off. I, I love that you're showing them off. And uh, this <clears> is lemons. Lemons with a little uh, sugar? Cream sugar bowl. Yeah, see, look, it's not that impressionistic. You figured out what it was. <laughs> no, I love, I love the simplicity of them. I love the colors. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot it's of fun. It's all excellent. And uh, so you've mentioned classes. Do we say you're self-taught? Well, a little bit, but I mean, I do follow people and um, go in their style. But now, uh, as a matter of fact, it began today. I'm doing a painting a day. It's a challenge to do um, a painting a day, and it's all my style. I set up the still life, or if I go outside, I you know find the spot where I want to do. It's hard to do that quickly, um, you know. Plus, because I have a job, so. <laughs> a painting like this takes how long? 
that took me an evening in an art class that I go to um, up in the North Hills. Two, three hours. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it's excellent. Now, I did some extra work on it later on, um, but it's like it's all, the paint is wet, it's oil, so you can do a lot of stuff with that, and then you can let it dry a little bit and, and finish it up. And are you always in oil? Do you do acrylics too? Or? I have yes, I do acrylics. I have done pastels. Um, I've even done a little bit of watercolor, although that's not my favorite. I think watercolor is too hard. You have to have such patience, and uh, um, uh, you—it's just hard. I know a lot of people love to do it, but uh, I find oil painting easier. Well, because I've been to your house and I, I've seen some of the paintings there, I, 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 I thought, who's that? painter, the Pittsburgh painter of some renown, uh, who's a singer. It's William Henry Singer. Junior. Mm -hmm. Junior. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he was the son of a Pittsburgh steel magnate? Yes, he was. And he had four children. And um, he, uh, it was Singer Nimick Steel. Actually, I have Singer and Nimick yes, written singer, down there. Yes, Singer Nimick Steel. And he sold it to, I want to say, Frick before 29. So, okay. you know. Oh, smart. And that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then what he decided to do, and it's actually, there's an article in the New York Times, he decided to give all of his children his proceeds from that. Instead of waiting for him to die, he allowed, he gave that to his children. And three of the children stayed here. And then William with Anna, Anna Brew Singer, from Hagerstown, Maryland, which is where the first Singer Museum uh, was. Um, I'm actually the third Anna Singer. Um, she and her husband, William, and I always think it's funny too because it's William and Anna, which is my brother and myself, Billy and Annie, Okay. Um, which is kind of fun. She went to Peabody to study piano. Wow. So um, she was a pianist, and they, um, they were painting here, and I think he even went to Monhegan Island at one point, but then he went to Paris, and he didn't really like that. So then he moved to north of Amsterdam, a little town called Laren, L-A-R-E-N, and they bought a house there, and then they also bought a summer house in Bergen in Norway. So there was a there's a singer museum, still a singer museum in uh, Laden, and a museum outside of Bergen or in Bergen. What was a lot of fun is that in I think it's 2005 or 2006. I'm terrible with dates. Um, the museum, the Laden museum, contacted me and said, "We are doing." Um, a show uh, we would like you to come we're opening we have just built we're celebrating 50 years of this museum which was their house originally and uh, we would like you to come and sing in the um, the beautiful salon hall the recital hall and I said well yes of course because Queen Beatrix is going to be there so you're going to sing for Queen Beatrix wow. so I got to sing for Queen Beatrix um, a wonderful uh piece of music and you know when she came she came down the the aisle and they, they had put a little table here for her beautiful little purse and her hat and everything and so that was part of the celebration of the opening of the uh, l'orangerie which is a part of the museum in bergen and no this one is in laden l-a-r-e-n and um anna singer's piano was there so i played anna singer's piano um, which was Anna her, plays Anna. Anna plays Anna, and then the second Anna singer was my father's mother, Anna Turner Singer. Wow! Yeah, and no connection to sewing machines. None, none whatsoever. But people must assume that they do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh. none. Uh, the Singer sewing machine is a Jewish family, and everyone assumes that I'm Jewish because Singer is a Jewish name. But uh, it's also English. So. But it's also cool that you're a singer. Well, yeah. <laughs> What's really cool is I was adopted and became a singer in the singer family. <laughs> it's like, what? They weren't expecting that. No, 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 not at all. Um, but I, I also want to talk a little bit about the fact that I have mentioned a couple times already that I've been to your house. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyone who's been to Anna and Dawn's house, it's just an amazing location. She lives on Grandview Avenue on Mount Washington with 
an astounding view of Pittsburgh. It is uh, an amazing view. It used to be the Kennywood House. Right. I was there when it was uh, Anne and Carl Hughes. and Carl Hughes. Hughes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, they had a... They used to have a uh, carousel, carousel horse, horse mm -hmm. in the front window right. where you have a piano now. Yes, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, I, I was, but you, you've you done things. You put the deck up top. And we did. We did. So and we also pushed it out a little bit too because it has a backyard, which is unusual for properties up there. So um, we have a backyard. We It's five stories, um, but it's only 24 feet wide. So it's, it's interesting in that. And so the first floor is you know it's the whole room so we have the front living area with the piano and then a dining area and then the kitchen and a small uh kitchen nook there and then we go out into the backyard um which is you know it's right and and and, and you know despite your entire history in new york city you have an elevator too <laughs> we do but you know i grew up with an elevator because my mother was always sick she couldn't climb the stairs because of her heart oh. so i grew up with elevators okay um and like there, there must be a joy in that, too, just the house. Oh, I think the house is such an amazing place, and the house takes care of us um, so beautifully, but the house also loves it when people come. You can tell. <laughs> I mean, I know when I spoke with Carl, when we first met him, they didn't want to leave, and it didn't have an elevator then, but he just he was having heart problems, and he just couldn't get up and down the stairs anymore. But um, the house, it, we have people there. We have events there. Um, we're going to have an event for WQED there in October. So um, it, it, the house just opens up. It's just... No, I mean, I... It's wonderful. And, you know, you've been up there on the top. I've and, been there for a couple of years for New Year's Eve. And you've been for, there for New Year's Eve, exactly. And I met David up there. <laughs> right, right, yeah, so, right. Uh, we both had on red bow ties, I remember. <laughs> that, uh, exactly, exactly. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know, I can't remember if he was playing the cello or not. Um, he didn't play the cello then, but he has played his ukulele. Yes. There. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and so, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, what happens next? <laughs> Do you still have dreams? Is there a role you'd like to play? Is oh, there there's something a... you want to paint or... <clears throat> there's a couple roles I'd love to play, but I don't think that's ever going to happen, unfortunately. Just because... <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's a younger world now, y younger opera singers, and um, I'm pretty much out of the loop. I, if I could do something, I would have to spend a little bit more time in New York City. And my life is full here. It really is. And I still sing. I sing with a, a church in Swickley. I'm their uh, section leader and soloist, so I s continue to sing there. And um, I do have an opportunity to sing Julia Child again. Uh, with uh, through the auspices of Pittsburgh Opera, it's going to be out at the High Hold uh, at the end of October. At the High Hold. At the High Hold. So the chef himself will be giving a demo demonstration, and, and probably then, some great food. And there there will be a dinner, and uh, so that will be a lot of fun. Actually, I didn't get to tell you the first time I did Julia Child uh, was out at Fox Chapel, uh, the Shady Side Academy, and uh, we were getting ready for it, and. Uh, Don comes walking back, and he sees this person there, and he says, and I'm dressed as Julia, excuse me, could you tell me where Anna Singer is, please? No. <laughs> he, he didn't recognize me. No. Wow. That is one of my gifts as an actor, actress, singer. I can disappear into the character that I become. That is excellent. Yeah, it yeah. really is. I, directors haven't recognized me. I've not been able to get into the after party because no you weren't in the show <laughs> it's, it's it's very interesting i yeah. was the show i was the show yeah baby <laughs> um that, no that's uh pretty amazing and uh you know how did you find that work originally i mean because it seemed to be such a nice fit how did you find the julia opera or... oh the julia opera um i think uh how did i find it i think someone knew about it and just said uh, would you be interested in doing this? Um, might have been uh, uh, um, Andres Cladera. Uh, I worked, I, I, the first time I did it was when I did it out there at uh, Shadyside, and they also did Fantastic Mr. Fox. Cool. Which, um, and that cast actually won a Grammy for that recording of that opera, because they recorded it. Excellent. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but uh, so I think it was part of that. That's how that came about. All right. As part of gum bands, I like to ask people about uh, a, a place in Pittsburgh that you love to eat. It doesn't have to be the favorite, or you could name no, a couple no, places. No, no, I, no. I love to eat at Carmela's at La Tavola. Oh. I Yeah, that is just great. Um, but um, La Tavola is on Mount Washington. It's on Mount it's Washington. It's Italian. And it's it started Italian. as a pizza place. It started. Joe was a, the cook there. And then what happened is um, I was taken up there by Tony Sinatra because I was teaching um, Tony's stepson voice. So they had a big party up there, and uh, the voice of the pirates, uh, former voice of the pirates. Um, Bob Prince? No, no, no. Lou. Um, um, You're asking uh, me about something I know, uh, you don't so know little about. Okay, anyway, I'll think of it tonight at 3. And um, he uh, was part of the, uh, the party that was there, and uh, he said, you know, I listened to you on the radio before I broadcast at, uh, at from the pirates oh, so i excellent. love your voice i love what you do and um uh, that was a lot of fun so i met them there and then we went to the cigar dinner uh and i think i was the only female there and of course it was room filled with smoke but i started singing because that's what i do i mean um so i you can't I, control yourself i can't i can't control myself i mean i've sung on the bridge o mio babino caro in florence uh the the bridge that where it's supposed to where she's going to jump off if she doesn't get her daddy to agree to letting me him her marry the boy she loves so yeah i, I sang there so that opened up a whole bunch of i've sung for weddings for them and funerals for them and i can continue to sing there, um, you know, uh, in an evening and have a good time. But um, uh, Fig and Ash, uh, great restaurant. The High Holt, love the High Holt. Um, Fig and Ash on the north side, it, High, Holt, and, uh, High Holt out, out in, out in the... Crafton or uh, beyond Crafton or... Uh, I, Coriopolis? Coriopolis? I think... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's on the way to the airport. Um, it's on the way to the airport. <laughs> Vivo in Swickley. Love Vivo in Swickley. Um, uh, I, take me out to a great restaurant. The Ethiopian restaurant uh, over here in, in... East Liberty? In East Liberty. I've been there in a long time. Yeah. Um, I just... Yeah. I love going out to eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent. And, um, and I'd just sort of be interested... A, a typical day... I think sometimes you come in and select music and then you go home and sometimes you broadcast from your home. The typical day is I'm here in the morning and I select music and do what I need to do here. And then I have a, you know, maybe a two hour break where I'm running and doing errands or uh, working out or walking or doing something like that. And then I do enjoy uh, broadcasting from home because um, it's just, it's very comfy cozy there. I love this studio that we have, um, but it's, it's just convenient. I, get, I sign off and I go downstairs and make dinner. It's great. No, I, I, I think I came out during the pandemic and shot you there. You did, there. you did. Because we yeah. were doing a little history of WQED TV and mm -hmm. WQED multimedia. Right, um, right. And uh, now we're gonna do something more about the radio station because 50 is so significant. It is. And uh, that'll be totally fun. And I, I, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> but I, I've always enjoyed talking to you. And I enjoy, you know, just stopping by the studio and doing pledge with you and stuff it, like that. So, it, it, yeah. it, you know, I can't thank you enough for being on Gum Bands. Is there anything else we should have talked about? I, um, I, well, this, this little picture here, um, I have a Barbie collection. Because when I was a little girl... I didn't um, even notice it was Barbie. Uh, oh. I, when I was a little girl, my mom, mommy would not let me have a Barbie because, you know, she, her <laughs> tatas were too big, big. So, um, uh, and then Dawn plays the trumpet and the song that's in there is, what are you doing New Year's Eve? So New Year's has been a big um, a gathering for all kinds of people. We bring everyone together and that's a lot of fun. Uh, this is Desdemona, which is one of my favorite roles uh, in, from Verdi's Otello. Uh, this was a wonderful show that I did with Pittsburgh Opera, The Grapes of Wrath, by Ricky Ian Gordon. And um, I played uh, Grandma. And uh, that was a, an amazing, amazing uh, tour with Pittsburgh Opera. 
I also got to do, finally, The Daughter with the Regiment, the opera that made me uh, go into opera. I played the Duchess of Krakenthorpe uh, for uh, Pittsburgh Opera a couple years ago. I guess it's almost 10 years ago or, or something like that right now. So, um, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry I missed so many of these. Oh, it was, it was a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. I feel so blessed to have the life I have, to be on the radio, to know people like you, to be a part of uh, Jim and WQED. It's just... I, I never, never expected that. I really didn't. And um, I'm very, very happy. And I feel very lucky to be here in Pittsburgh. I, I have the same feeling of gratitude about knowing you. So that's really wonderful. And I thank you so much. And uh, so I want everybody to know, two to six. Two to six. Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday, mm-hmm. WQED FM. Uh, and, uh, you know... I, I, we just got to keep going. Okay. Sounds good to me. All right. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> Thank so you, much. Thank you, Rick. This Gum Bands podcast is made possible by the Buell Foundation, serving southwestern Pennsylvania since 1927, and by listeners like you. Thank you. Thank you.